Welcome, everyone. You are listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast on Mental Health News Radio Network. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Lori Lee Binstock, host of a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast on Mental Health News Radio Network and anywhere you get your podcast. Today's guest is Katherine Walker, CEO of Revitalist Lifestyle and Wellness, a leading mental health and wellness company powered by a comprehensive team of specialty providers. Katherine is also a strong advocate for psychedelic medicine and recently earned her second master's degree in psychiatric nursing as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. She's also the author of inflamed theory which i am so excited to get get into um so catherine thank you so much for joining me today yeah happy to be here well i i do want to get i get into the inflamed theory but i want to know what is it that brought you into this space because usually there's a driving force where it you know for people who want to help other people what is it what was that for you so, um, so I worked in the hospital for about 20 years as a nurse, and then I became an anesthesia provider and practiced anesthesia for about 10 years. And um, I went to five different hospitals, did trauma, call, OB, hearts, brains, whatever, right? And um, honestly, I was sitting there in the OR one day, and we were doing a big brain tumor surgery. And our success from that type of surgery is you want someone to wake up within 20 minutes after it was about a six hour surgery, you want to move all four extremities and, and your success, right? That means you did a good anesthetic. So at that time I had been reading about ketamine specifically for mental health and pain. And as an anesthesia provider, we're professional ketamine experts in the mm -hmm. OR. Um, but I was sitting there and, you know, and really I just had this purpose change uh, while I was sitting there because I saw like... Yes, it's great that I can provide a great anesthetic and I can allow this person to move their extremities, you know, um, after this surgery, but this person only had six weeks left to live. Mm. And one thing I noticed is in the outpatient environment, the outpatient environment is very risk averse. As an anesthesia provider, we are the highest trained critical care providers you're ever going to find. That's, that's our comfort zone is, you know, right before people die. So I sat there and I thought, you know, um, what if you took someone with my skill set and you put me in the front instead of right at the end? Because usually they will call in anesthesia right before someone's dying. Like that's when you know it's really bad that no, like all your specialists in the hospital, they're done. They're calling in anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, what if you took us from way back here and you put us way up here at the front with this mental health crisis, with all the suicidality, all these things that people are scared to death to treat and they'd prefer to send somebody to the emergency room where we actually provide more trauma in the emergency room to people typically. It's like, what, what would happen, right? If we shifted the narrative. Yeah. So, so that's kind of, you know, how I got into it. And then once I opened the clinic, I really started seeing, oh my gosh, this is way worse than I thought it was. Um, I started seeing how egocentric we are in the hospital and we are amazing. We're extremely well-trained in the hospital se sector but we know nothing about the outpatient sector. So it's like, if we can take some of those skills in the inpatient, put them in the outpatient world, train us to be more on the um, front end. Mm -hmm. I really think that's how we can change, you know, the mental health crisis that we currently see right now. Wow. Am amazing. So, you know, getting into that, you've wrote, you've written this book in flame theory, what can you share with the audience? Because I know inflammation, it's been like long, well known as, you know, you know, symptom of many infectious diseases, you know, but, and it could be a problem with pretty much everything, you know, <laughs> in my opinion, but, um, and I'll get into why I think that, but could you share with this audience, what is the inflamed theory? So inflamed theory. So I, I did inflame just as the general, cause I want to do a series of books under mm. the title inflamed because there's so much inflamed. If you want to talk about, you know, it's like internally there's inflammation externally, Eastern medicine hates Western medicine, Western medicine hates Eastern medicine, you know, political regulators, everybody hates everybody. Like we are constantly <laughs> living in a situation of inflammation, um, internal, external, and all those pieces. So that's kind of the title of it all. But the theory piece is because I've created my own theory. Um, I've been around maybe 15,000 patients and clients 
who have participated with ketamine and psychedelic therapies. And I sat down and I did consults with these people, but I did consults from an anesthetic mindset of neurology, not from a psychiatric mindset of psychiatry. Um, so when I sat down, I was trying to pinpoint patterns as to what is the brain doing? Hmm. Because think about it, all the other organs in our body, they're all on patterns, right? We can say, oh yeah, you're in mild kidney failure. You're in moderate kidney failure. Same with your heart, same with your liver, same with every other organ, except our brain. Hmm. And for some reason, we put our brain like it's this one creature that like doesn't really exist in our body that nobody really understands. And kind of my thought process is the brain probably functions in a similar manner as every other organ in our body. It's just a little bit more complex because not only is it anatomical and physiological, but there's also words to it, right? So it is the whole psychology aspect. Right. So, you know, so with the book, the theory aspect, we're in the process of validating the theory, which would be amazing. Um, but really, I think personally, the brain's not nearly as eclectic as we think it is. I think it's more complex than we give it credit for. Right. And it's personally not me personally. I'll tell people all the time, you're not ill. Your brain's functioning on the wrong path. And, and there's a really big difference, right, with that. Because if we can identify the path that the brain's functioning on and with ketamine and psychedelics, help to bring it back to kind of the trailhead, we can help to reset a lot of these um, processes that are off, which over time will help to regulate your chemical imbalances, which will help to regulate your hormones, which will decrease your inflammation. Um, but really my theory exists more on Newton's laws of physics. So like the third law of motion, every reaction has an equal and opposite or every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Um, I think that's a big premise for it. But two, I personally don't believe that chemical imbalances create mental health disorders. I believe that's something later down the line. I think it's more conflict with data interpretation. Um, hmm. And from a neuroscience standpoint, we're seeing, right, there's something called the default mode network, yeah. um, something called the salience network, which is one of my favorite guys um, to talk about, and then also the executive function network. So those are the three big ones that I like to talk about. And it allows, when, once we can kind of understand those, that's when ketamine, psychedelics, and therapy become the powerhouse that we can work with in order to kind of reset these data processing centers. Any chance you'd be able to briefly um, break down those three? Yes, yes. Um, so, so basically, right, the default mode network, it's becoming more popular that people mm -hmm. like to talk about that one. And each of these, you can find neuroscience chapters on each of these, but I like to break things down as simple as possible. So yes, please. Understand. <laughs> but you know, but you're, you're basically your default mode network is your baseline patterns, right? That's your default mode. A normally functioning default mode network is supposed to have a positive action equals a positive reward or mm -hmm. a negative action equals a negative reward. When they get off track, sometimes it can be a negative action creates a positive reward or a positive action creates a negative reward. So when you're talking to people who are struggling with their mental health, they may go to the gym and want to cry. Mm -hmm. They just feel like their emotions are all over the place. That's typically a, an abnormally de functioning default mode network. People who are struggling with addictions, that's your number one person who's really struggling with their default mode network because if you think about addiction right people don't want to do the drug but they need to do the drug mm -hmm. so if you're thinking about the positive right so say if i um if i'm on heroin um i i know it's a negative action analytically i know that but if i go to use the drug it's going to give me a positive response in my brain so it's a negative action creating a positive response but as soon as i do the drug, then I have this psychological abuse of shame. Mm -hmm. So really addiction to me, right, is it's a pattern of psychological abuse within yourself. And it's really hard to break yourself from it because you're, you're in this abusive situation internally. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's kind of the default mode network. The salience network is my favorite. Yeah. So the salience network is your aggregator. So when data comes in, what does your brain do with the data, right? So if you and I are sitting there next to each other and there's a statement that comes in, 
you're going to hear it differently than I am just because we've been trained different. We come from different cultures, like, you know, different professions, whatever else, like you're going to hear it differently than I. So when that data comes in, what does your brain do with it? Does it hyperinflate the response? Does it hypoinflate the response or is it neutral? And because a lot of people, when they hear something, they'll feel overly anxious and they're like, why, why, like, why am I like that? And it's not them consciously doing it. It's them subconsciously doing it. And your right. subconscious, I always tell people, is stupid, simple, strong, right? It's, you know, your touch, sight, all the different, you know, your five senses is your subconscious if it feels like there's a threat. So your salience network and the beautiful thing with ketamine and psychedelics is when data comes in, instead of feeling that emotional too high or too low response, you can analyze the material coming in and then you can help work with the response that you want to have and right. that's how you can reset a lot of those things so that's your salience network and then your executive function network is your task oriented network um females are very we're very very good task masters right right with <laughs> your executive function all day you do all your tasks but you're never processing ever, anything. You're just doing tasks. So what happens at nighttime and teenagers too, are kind of um, with their executive function network. Um, when you go to lay down at nighttime and you can't turn your brain off, that's your executive function network. So there's an imbalance of actionable items versus processing of items. Um, but once you can kind of understand those three guys, how they work together and they're all working at the same time then that's how, you know, you can really start to get back in charge of your own mental health and wellness. Right. Absolutely. Because I'm, I'm thinking of all the things that, you know, when one person is just like, oh, did you get invited to this, this party? And you're like, no, thank goodness. And the other person's upset because they're like, oh, I didn't get invited. Like, one person has this like idea. And I, I think that they, it comes back to all these different attachments theories in, in my head um, just because like some people people experience life so differently and so these these things and so the salience um, network that was very interesting so thank you for for um, sharing that with me because I didn't I, I know about default mode network um, and executive functioning but I really appreciate you breaking that that down for me right there um, so how does mental health contribute to inflammation um, in a way like so for instance, for me, I actually got all my hormones checked um, just because I, I struggle with um, premenstru premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, and one of the things, you know, like traditional doctors aren't, weren't helping me. Um, so I went to this, th this one place and they were like, let's get your hormones checked. And my surprising to them they're like everything's very low including my cortisol level but i've i've been through extreme trauma i'm a childhood sexual abuse survivor and um you know that kind of rolled into so many other different traumas that um happened in my life and i'm constantly stressed and so i think what they were saying was that the my cortisol levels were kind of dangerously low on to to them they're like this is very odd you're there it's very low but what you're telling me is that you you deal with stress on such a like daily basis and they were saying well maybe it's because you know you my my love i've been so overly stressed that my cortisol levels just like kind of tapped out <laughs> they were like we're, we're we can't go any higher but this was um so it was really interesting interesting to me and you know i they, they put me on like some topical like hormone stuff um but I, you know i'm wondering like cortisol levels like is is when we are trying to help um heal like inflammation, are we trying to keep our 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 cortisol levels down? Is or is there way more to it? Yeah, I mean you're you're trying to keep everything regulated, right? right. So so um you know a couple of things with that and in your serotonin. So so one way that I look at it is um so picture like you know you you're the world right and you've got an axis. And the world's on this axis and everything's beautiful. It's just flowing. Everything's fine. Well, once that axis starts getting off just a little bit, just by a degree or two, mm -hmm. in order to keep the same rotation, there's more energy that has to go into that. So you're, you're, you're getting off track 
per se. So, so, you know, think about a car. I always like to use my car analogy in mental health. You have Ferrari and this is the way mental health works today. You have a, you are a Ferrari and you are overheating. Well, what we do in mental health today is we bring in a bucket of water to, to pour on you, to cool you down. And mm -hmm. instead we're not recognizing like, no, no, this is a Ferrari. This is an amazing car. Let's get in and let's fix the engine. So it's not overheating. And that's what we don't do right now is to fix the engine. So, so picture, you know, if you're this car, this amazing car, a normally running car, maybe, you know, going at 3000 RPMs and it's just smooth and everything's great. And it's in alignment, which is a big thing. And mental health is trying to be in alignment with yourself versus someone who's out of alignment, the car's off track, right? And it, you're pushing at 6,000 to 7,000 RPMs and you're going 30 miles an hour. So you're expelling so much energy, but you're not getting in return what you're putting in. So a lot of times I'll tell people, it's almost like having a um, hole in our gas tank. And what we do is we just keep putting gas in that gas tank, but there's a hole in the gas tank. So when your cortisol mm. levels are low, it's because you're expelling all of your cortisol and you don't have enough, right? Um, in order to keep everything going. So what we have to do is we have to decrease that inflammatory system that's going on, you know, cause it's, it's, a, it's like a cytokine storm, um, which is just all inflammation that your body is just constantly, it thinks it needs to right? Mm -hmm. all your baby cells. Um, and you'll, if, you know, if you've been around ketamine and psychedelics, people will say sometimes my, I feel like my body's vibrating and they can actually feel those vibrations. Well, usually if you feel those vibrations, you do have typically trauma there because what will happen, right, is those vibrations in the cells, they're in medicine. We don't like to say energy. We like to tell everybody they're crazy if they say the <laughs> word energy. Um, but if we say hyper excitable cells, we do believe those words, right? So mm. hyper excitable just means the little guys are just moving faster and all the cells in our body vibrate. So if we can learn to decrease that vibration speed is, which is actually ketamine helps with that. Psychedelics helps with that. There's a certain type of, um, oh, exercise called like tray therapy. It's like tension release. Mm. Basically when you do a plank and you're sitting there shaking, that actually can help to decrease yeah. cellular vibrations. But if we can learn to, to decrease the vibration speed from a physiologic level. And that's where we mess up a little bit with talk therapy, mm. slow down, take a breath. And you're like, no, like, I feel like there's a bear coming. It's like, just take a breath. Those are two different systems. So right. we have to figure out how we lower that inflammatory stress, which will allow your body's cortisol levels to naturally restore themselves. But it's the same thing with serotonin. And this is something that, you know, more I learn, the more I'm like, we don't, we don't know anything. Um, but with serotonin too, right? When we're stressed, mm -hmm. we use more serotonin. So therefore right. we're depleted with serotonin. And that's why when you're really, really stressed, you're usually not hungry. It's because serotonin gives you that sense of being full, you know, so a lot um. of people lose weight after trauma It's because they're actually producing more serotonin. So what do we do? We just give you more serotonin to, to keep producing, right? Like none of it yeah. makes sense, but yes. Yeah, so, so cortisol is huge serotonin's huge um you know one thing with your cortisol levels once what they sh will show over time over long time periods of stress is people if they have um their blood pressure their blood pressure is lower typically you don't see it in men but you'll see it in females yeah their, me <laughs> yeah so if their blood pressure is lower it's usually because they have decreased cortisol levels Hmm. Okay. That is me. I'm, I'm always my, my it's, it's always low. Um, but you br bring up psychedelics and I, and, and, and the shaking because, um, actually last week I tried for my first time five MEO DMT Yeah. and, um, it was, uh, it was, it was an experience like none other I've tried, I've tried, um, psilocybin, I've tried LSD, I've tried M um, MDMA for, um, for trauma and they've, transformed my life incredibly but the 5 meo like my body was convulsing like it was shaking to the point where i was like like throughout my entire body then i was crying hysterically moaning and i've never had like i've had like crying fits when i've done the psilocybin but the 5 meo 
I felt like I just felt all of this, this, the trauma, the stress, everything just, just leaving my body. And it was the most incredible thing I've ever, I've ever felt. And that's, and you're just saying this now. So I feel like it's, I feel so validated. Um, and I, I, I've read a lot of stuff on somatic experiencing and that the shaking of the, the trauma out of your body and how and that's what animals naturally do. But, um, I want, I wanted to talk to you about all of the psychedelics that, that help and ketamine is included while not a classic psychedelic, correct? Mm -hmm. It's still, it still helps with all of this. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Ketamine, you know, it's interesting because people are still trying to figure, you know, as you know, people are trying to figure all this stuff out and it's, mm -hmm. it's going to, hopefully it's going to be like healthcare 2.0 that yeah. we can just update the entire system and use these medications accordingly because it, it's helping on, you know, so many different systems. Like yeah. psilocybin is actually showing the heart can recover better after a heart attack, right? So even the traditional medicine stuff, we're seeing psychedelics are actually having an impact. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but one thing I love to talk about, right, um, is the term vulnerability. And I speak about this in my book, too, because um, if you look up vulnerability, the website misguides you kind of as to what vulnerability is, my, my personal impression, because, you know, we all say, oh, you've got to be vulnerable to heal and vulnerability just looks sexy if a man's vulnerable and all this stuff. Right. Like we, we say it's like this, like great thing. And, you know, what I like to tell people is, you know, vulnerabilities when I take you to the Congo and I drop you off and you have no money, no friends, no mm -hmm. phone, no shelter, right? You are then in a vulnerable position, which is kind of a state of being out of control. So talking about, you know, how I, I'd like to link my theory back to Newton's third law of motion, every action has equal and opposite reaction. Anytime our brain hits conflict, which is typically in a situation that it's not used to, that it's not really like, you know, conquered per se. So when it hits that conflict, it will go to polarities. So if someone's sitting in a state of vulnerability, which is a state of being out of control, the brain will try to match that energy. It follows the, you know, the, the conservative laws of um, energy as well, but it will try to match that energy level to balance itself because the brain loves to be balanced but balance isn't always positive balance mm. it's just matching the energies so if someone's in a situation to where they're truly vulnerable they're truly out of control they're going to over control that situation and typically what who over controls that situation is not your conscious mind it's your subconscious mind Mm. And so a lot of times I'll tell people, you've got your conscious mind, you've got your subconscious mind. Uh, data came out that said 5% of our decisions that we make in life are based on our conscious thoughts. Yeah. 95% yeah. is based on your subconscious. Yes. So I tell people, it's like our conscious mind is actions, right? What's my grocery list? Like, what do I want to do for a vacation? Like that's your conscious mind. Your subconscious mind is reactions. So anytime we react in a situation, it's probably because we feel like we're in a moment of being out of control. And we're not, again, we're not consciously thinking this. It's our subconscious that's stupid, simple, strong. It's picked up <laughs> on something that makes us reactionary. So, you know, I like to talk like, or to people about that because when you go into the psychedelic field and if you're participating with psychedelics, what psychedelics do is they... They act as a catalyst to get you to sit with yourself in the present moment. When you're sitting with yourself in the present, you're not connected to anything, right? No anxiety, no depression, no trauma, no pain, no nothing. Like none of those positive or negative coping mechanisms actually exist in the present. So they're all protective measures that come down. So when we take psychedelics, they're acting as a catalyst to get us to sit with ourselves in the present which is in a vulnerable state. Mm -hmm. So fortunately with psychedelics, you know, we have that analytical uh, piece a little bit more to where we understand we're in the psychedelic medicine space. But when these things come to the surface, a lot of times traumas from your past may come to the surface, right? Because you are sitting in a vulnerable space in a period of being 
out of control because you're sitting with yourself in the present, the brain does not want to ever feel like it's being out of control. So if it feels that way, it will send things to the surface that typically cause you to trigger or to react in order to protect yourself. But the beautiful mm -hmm. thing with psychedelics is you're not connected to any of that. So you're sitting there and you can analyze it. And then when you don't respond, because you're just sitting there processing all of this, the brain will actually recognize that and it will process it. And it takes it from our short-term memory, which all the emotions and memories are attached from trauma. Mm -hmm. And we'll put it into the long-term memory and our brain can start differentiating what's real versus what's not real. Because yeah. traumas, when we were out of control 30, 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? Our brain does not understand time. It only understands time and planes. So when situations come up, we feel like a loser. Like, why am I responding like that? I'm not in that situation anymore. You know, but our brain is responding like it happened in real time if we've not processed it effectively. And the only reason it feels less is because of the coping mechanisms that we've developed. But if we can help our brain to sit there with it and to see these different things and to analyze them, our brain will then put it into our long-term memory. When it puts it into our long-term memory, the emotions are detached from the situation. Yeah. So then you can talk about it and be like, oh, that was horrible, right? Talking about your sexual trauma as a child, like you've processed a lot of that because you, like you can talk about it and you don't shut down. Other right. people who can't talk about it, it's not that anybody's stronger or weaker. It's one still has it in their short-term memory and they literally can feel the emotions directly attached to the situation mm -hmm. versus someone who has it back here in their long-term memory. They can bring up the situation. They can attach the emotion should they choose, but the emotion doesn't lead the story. Wow. And that's why psychedelics are so powerful. And I always tell people, if you're leading with an emotion, rage, agitation, short tempered, whatever, right? If you're leading with any of that, something up here is stuck and it's, right. and it's, and it's torturing us literally like we're in daily torture. And that's when psychedelics come into play. And as you know, you become empowered in who you are with these and, the, and those things that are haunting you daily, they don't have the same burn that they had before you did those and then you start evolving into the person that you want to be instead of being stuck from the past of all this nastiness that we had to go through. Yeah, it is really hard to evolve when you're stuck in the past mm -hmm. because I, I'm telling you, I do not recognize who I was before psychedelics. Like I can't even believe some of my reactions to certain things, you know, prior to psychedelics. And so, yes, it has, it has changed my life immensely. And I'm, I'm so grateful that they exist. I'm, you know, I, I wish they were more accessible. Um, um, but, you know, I, I feel like, like you're saying, you know, healthcare 2.0, hopefully this is like, this is, this is what we, we have that um, to look forward to. Um, and so how do we decrease it, is, is, do we focus specifically on psychedelics? What if there are people who are afraid to take psychedelics? There are people that I know I speak to. I'm like, you know, psychedelics would really help you. Um, but obviously I'm not pushing them or dosing them or doing anything um, except for sharing my own personal story. But if if they have, if they, if they need to, well, we, we can lower inflammation. How do we do that if not with psychedelics? You know, I, I, um, I don't know. I, I've eaten so much crow, right. In my life, I <laughs> get more crow, like the more I learn, the more crow I'm like, okay, yeah, was wrong on that one. Wrong on that one. Wrong there. Um, but you know, one thing that I just, I love is, um, functional mushroom supplements, mm -hmm. inflammation, right. And those don't cause any type of change in your mental health. Cause I know that's scary for a lot of people. And, you know, w when we've had people who've came in who want to do psychedelics or ketamine, like I always do a dose. Like I'll tell them, I'm like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a dose first. You're not even going to be able to tell that you feel different. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is, and when you're sitting there with psychedelics, like literally you're like, huh, I feel vulnerable right now. 
Like you yeah. put that turn on how you feel, right? Versus in life, right? When we're reacting to everything, where it yeah. cause we are vulnerable, but we can't identify it at that time. So like I, I like to train people to say, you know, start with like just take a placebo dose and then take a, you know, one tenth of the normal dose, right? And you slowly, slowly, slowly get yourself there because what you have to do is once you start entering that space of just feeling a little bit different, consciously, you have to tell your subconscious, you're starting to feel vulnerable right now and it's okay because you're safe. Yeah. So you're becoming your own internal healer, right? So um, so that's what I would definitely say. And then of course, you know, sometimes trauma survivors, we go big or go home. Um, so it's like, oh no, this was great. Let me, let me go from like, you know, 300 milligrams of psilocybin to I'm going to do eight grams. And it's like, no, 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 nope, don't, <laughs> don't do that. You know, like, let's slowly like titrate it to effect and, and slowly learn about yourself. But, um, but yeah, but people who are just looking for the inflammatory aspects and talking about inflammation, um, it's anything, right? When, when the brain gets inflamed, the body becomes inflamed mm -hmm. um, and it creates all these weird, weird, weird symptoms of everything. Right. So, you know, a lot of people will get fibromyalgia, which in medicine, you know, it's really hard to talk to somebody about fibromyalgia because we can't see it on paper. So, you know, a lot of people in the medical field will say, oh, you're crazy if you have fibromyalgia. No, not at all. Something happens to where fibromyalgia is like 97, 98% directly related to trauma. And trauma can be physical, it can be verbal, it can be psychological, it can be, it can be anything, right? It's mm -hmm. something, and this is something I talk about too. It's something that knocks you off track is trauma. So yeah. of course, you know, assault and different things like that. Of course we see those as trauma, but it's something that changes your identity is typically what trauma is um, as to what I can see with people that I've talked to. So it could be a statement, you know, it could be like, I, I had a girl one time um, that was in elementary school, 4.0, all these made all of her A's and like in fourth grade, her teacher told her that she was like vomit in her mouth, you know? So just that one statement led to this person who's now in their thirties led to anxiety, depression, cutting, suicidality, all these mm. things, right? Because this child was trying to be the best child she could possibly be. And then one of her administrators like destroyed her little tiny soul, right? With yeah. that statement. So, so, you know, so that person starts leaving, leading that pay or that um, kind of lifeline of inflammation. But um, the mushrooms, the reason I say with the mushrooms, so there's like cordyceps, reishi, um, lion's mane lion's mane yeah turkey tail we actually have one called lion's brain and it's amazing it's our own proprietary one that we have at revitalist um i take it every day because literally like you take it in three hours you just feel better and it's because it's got b vitamins magnesium and a whole bunch of mixtures of uh legal mushrooms mm -hmm. uh, but it's anti-inflammatory it's also giving your brain what it needs on a cerebral level so it's amazing um, but a lot of these mushrooms will naturally act as anti-inflammatory agents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in traditional medicine, we look at like ibuprofen as an anti-inflammatory. Yes, but it's inducing that anti-inflammatory reaction. You know, it's, 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 it's creating it. It's not preventing it. And what it's these- It's not healing anything. That's right. That's right. And so the mushrooms, um, they will actually decrease the stress internally with your body which starts increasing blood flow. And when you have increased blood flow, right, you're getting increased nutrients, increased oxygen to all your cells, to all your neurotransmitters in your brain. And that's something I don't know if you've looked at ketamine specifically with the way that it actually helps the brain to start uh, building new neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. um, there's a beautiful picture of a PET scan um, that Yale University did back in the late 1990s or early 2000s. Like it's that old. Um, but after one ketamine infusion, it showed that the neurotransmitters in the brain were actually healthier looking. So the first one looked like a highway that had potholes in it. And then the off ramps looked like they were all closed or broken. Mm. The second one, after one ketamine session, the interstate looked like it had all of its potholes filled. And then all of its little exit ramps were actually con starting to be more connected. Wow. And what that is, is it's something called dendrites. 
So dendrites help our brain to communicate to different levels, right? So they're seeing now that Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, tons of pain syndromes. A lot of pain syndromes are actually complex PTSD yeah. from the pain. Um, but what they're seeing is a lot of these pieces are increasing the inflammation in our brain. And when it increases the inflammation in our brain, our cells that turn over like once every 30 days, they're not turning over to be healthy because they're being duplicated in an inflamed environment that has decreased oxygen, decreased blood and all these different pieces. So they're seeing people who have like thought blocking Alzheimer's dementia. It's not that the memories are gone. They're there. They can't retrieve them and they can't retrieve them a lot of times because a lot of the highways and the electrical functioning basically in our brain, it, it's, it's gone. Like it's right. broken. And now we're seeing we can regenerate it, right? With ketamine and psychedelics. Wow. I mean, do you hear that everyone? I mean, psychedelics is it's so significant in not just mental health, but our physical health and preventing diseases. And I love that that's why you want to focus on the front end of it all instead of the back end, because, you know, people have lives that are worth living. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult, you know, when I was before I, I even touched psychedelics for, for um, mental health purposes for my own trauma. I mean, like, I was just like, oh, okay, well, if I die, I die. It was just one of those things. I just didn't care. Cause I didn't like my life didn't feel like it was worth living. So um, it really changed everything. And so, yes, I'm grateful for that. And yes, I think like you're sit talking about functional mushrooms. I think that's that's wonderful. Um, and you know, I I'd, I'd love to link to your website so people can can find that. But um, is there anything else that you would like to add? You know, yes. Um, so the last thing I'd like to add is a big thing on, and that's one thing I'm trying to do is to help change the mental health narrative because mental health is real. All of our theories mostly are wrong. Um, so, you know, psychedelics are allowing us to see there is true data, right? This is true science. Like this is replicatable patterns um, that we're able to see, which give, should give the future or everyone like so much hope for the future. So, so one of my big things is um, changing the narrative from if to when. So like 70% of people throughout their lifespan will have a suicidal thought at one time. So right now we treat it as if you have suicidal ideations, go get help. It's not if you do. When you have these, these are some reasons as to why you may be having these, right? So typically it's stress. It's feeling out of control. Like suicide, suicidal ideation is the ultimate trying to over control everything. So if we're able mm -hmm. to change the narrative of if you have thoughts of ending your life, it's not depression. It's ineffective coping mechanisms. We want to get out of the current situation that we're in. And this is the only thing that we know to do. So, you know, if we can work on having a risk mitigation strategy, expecting that all of us at some time are going to have some struggles and we can change that and be more open and encompassing and empowering to each other instead of looking at each other like we're ill. Like, I think that will help to change the entire landscape. Wow. No, I absolutely agree. I could not agree more on that because that, that I was there. I was there where it was, I, I felt trapped and honestly, psychedelics really helped me understand why I felt like suicide was the only answer for a very long time. So thank you so much for all of the information, all of the wisdom that you've provided. I am so grateful and I'm, I'm very happy to have you on the podcast and thank, thank you. you so much yeah thanks for having me awesome well that was Catherine walker ceo of revitalist lifestyle and wellness and author of inflamed theory to purchase her book please go to the show notes and you will find a link for more information about Catherine. there is a piece uh, about her book and authentic insiders september issue she also um, is our cover model for september's issue so please check that out october's issue is also out check out authentic insider at trauma survivor thriver.com that's trauma survivor thriver.com as well as past episodes of a trauma survivor thrivers podcast if you haven't already please subscribe to my email list to get authentic insider magazine in your inbox monthly join us next week when i speak with tracy yokas author of bloodlines when we talk about generation 
generational cycles and what it takes to break them. You've been listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast on Mental Health News Radio Network. I'm Lori Lee Binstock. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. Take care. Thank you.